Well, welcome. Um, my name is Keith Poston. I'm the uh, President and Executive Director of the Public School Forum of North Carolina. Uh, we are delighted that you are here. This is an amazing crowd. I've got to tell you a story. We actually started when we, and I'm, we're going to tell you a little bit more about this whole Color of Education initiative tonight before uh, our guest of honor, Nicole Hannah-Jones, speaks. Um, but when we started our plans, we actually had booked about half of this room, and we were going to have the other half with the reception. And I think it was a, sometime around, I don't know, we started the tickets, we put the tickets on sale early one morning, and I think it was like 3 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon, I walked down to Rhonda's office and I said, uh, I guess to sort of paraphrase Jaws, I think we're going to need a bigger boat. <laughs> uh, so we got a bigger boat, we basically doubled it, and then I think the rest of the tickets were gone in a couple of days. So uh, thank you all for jumping on it, and we're just really delighted, and I think it speaks to not only the uh, um, uh, Nicole's um, star power and the respect that people in this room have for her, but also the importance of the issue. The, um, a couple of housekeeping things right off the top. We are using the hashtag color of education. So if you're tweeting, Instagramming, Facebooking, or whatever, please use that. Also, second, we want to keep be able to keep you informed and engaged after this event. So we've got some bowls back at the tables. Um, so we would ask you to please put your business cards. If you don't have those, we have little cards that were at your chairs just to capture your name and email. We just want to be able to share you because this is just the beginning of a new initiative that we're doing. We want to make sure that we can, can keep in touch with you. First, I want to acknowledge our partners from Duke who joined the public school forum in this new effort earlier this year. I mean, frankly, it was a bit of a leap of faith on all of our parts. Um, we knew the work was important, and we knew we were all committed to it, but we weren't exactly sure the scope of everything we were going to do, but we knew we were going to do it together. So I want to thank Fritz Mayer, who's sitting right here. Fritz with the uh, with Duke Policy Bridge, and then Dr. Sandy Darity. Sandy is not here with us tonight, unfortunately, but Sandy and the Cook Center for Social Equity, thank you for leaping with me. We're excited to be part of it with you. Now, when you're taking a leap of faith, one thing that helps is to have sponsors um, to help make an, an event like this happen. And I want to make sure that I acknowledge them tonight. We have our ambassador sponsors, as you'll see on the screen, Capital Broadcasting Company, the Grable Foundation, and UPS. So thanks, let's give them a round of applause for their support. And then our champion sponsors, Fidelity Investments, the John M. Belk Endowment, and the Maynard Family Foundation. We have representatives from all those groups here, so thank you all for them as well. Now, on the back of your program, there's a, there's a long list of people, and I'm not going to, just so we can get to our speaker, I'm not going to read everyone's name, but this is our guiding committee for the color of education. These are the group of folks who are working with us as we shape this. And really, the guiding committee, we actually had our first meeting together as a committee just last week. So this really wasn't about putting together this event. It's really more about what's going to happen after this event. And so I want to thank them um, for that as well. There are so many um, uh, wonderful VIPs here, uh, too many to name. I do want to recognize Dr. Tom Williams, our, the chairman of the board of the Public School Forum. Tom, thank you for being here. And. Last but not least on the thank yous, I want to thank two people who we could not have pulled this event off without their, uh, a few people who their very hard work. Patience Wall, who you're going to meet in a minute, Patience with Duke Policy Bridge, Sandra Conway, who is on the board of the Public School Forum, who um, really kind of moved into almost a staff position to help put this thing together, and then also on my team, Rhonda Van Dyke and Irene Mohn. Uh, they all worked so very hard, so I thank you for your work in making this happen. So why are we here? Two years ago, the Public School Forum completed a year-long study group exploring the barriers that children in North Carolina face in receiving a quality and equitable education. Actually, Dr. Dudley Flood and Dr. Michael Pretty are here tonight. They co-chaired that work. Alfred Mays is here. Alfred co-chaired the Racial Equity Committee's work. Now, just so you understand, if you don't know the Public School Forum, We've had a long history. We were founded in 1986. We've had a long history of focusing on equity issues, but particularly funding equity issues. And certainly we focused on, as we ran the, uh, what was then the, the, the previous North Carolina Teaching Fellows Program, we focused on things like teacher diversity. 
But our work with the study group really marked the first time when our organization really drilled in on the issue of race and bias and how black and brown students in North Carolina are treated differently and how their educational experiences are different, yielding, not surprisingly, different outcomes from their peers. Now, the data was shocking. Um, well, it was shocking at least to some of us who didn't see it or maybe didn't care enough to really look closely at it. But we looked at things, questions like, why were black students 40% more likely to be suspended than white students, oftentimes for the same offenses? Why were black students so underrepresented in placement in advanced courses, yet quite overrepresented in being identified as special ed? And how could a school system with a majority of black and Latinx students still have children going through their entire 12 years of public education and never having a teacher that looks like them. Now, I don't know if you noticed when I walked up here, but I'm a white guy. Now, in fact, if you're, if you're, if you're playing privilege bingo, um, you'd, you'd have a pretty full card with me. I'm a white, cisgender, male, natural born US citizen, heterosexual, so I've kind of got it all covered. But, but I've been blessed to have some people in my life and opportunities presented to me to open my eyes and my heart to what is going on. Um, and it's been my experience, my personal experience, is that when the scales fall away from your eyes, when your eyes have been opened, you can't unsee it. And you have to use whatever voice and whatever platform you have to do something. And that's what this is for me, and this is what it is for our organization. So. As you listen to Nicole and the other speakers tonight, I want you to ask yourself, why are you here? And what are you going to do differently tomorrow, next week, and next month? With that, I have the privilege of introducing my partner in all of this and my new friend, Dr. Keisha Bentley Edwards. Uh, Keisha is the Associate Director of Research at the Samuel Du Bois Cook Center on Social Equity. Give her a hand. I will be brief because I know who the star of this show is. Uh, I was very excited about joining this group. Uh, Patience is amazing, and she introduced me to the wonderful people at the Public Education Forum, as well as connected me with the Policy Bridge. And with that, uh, I was able to hone in on some of my passions, which is equity. Obviously, I work at the Cook Center on Social Equity, but not just equity, but this access to opportunity. And that's really what this work is about, and using your privilege in ways that open doors for people so you're not closing doors behind you. And so the work that Nicole does has spoken to me as someone who grew up in Southern California on the wrong part of Orange County, not the OC. and. <laughs> And thinking about myself as I've gotten more education and where my new daughters uh, are going to go to school and how I'm going to use my privilege, whether or not where I send my girls to school, what type of environment I want them to be in, and how, who I want them to learn from. And every time you write something, whether it's on Twitter or in The New Yorker, I'm always like, yes, yes. So I know why everyone is here. And I'm so happy that we're all in this moment together to hear, have the opportunity to hear you speak and to be a part of this journey with the color of education. And so with that, I'm going to stop and introduce Ms. Patience Wall from Duke Policy Bridge. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, Peabody Award winning, National Magazine Award recipient, 2017 MacArthur Genius Grant Fellow. These are just a few titles that highlight the impactful work of tonight's speaker. And I also like to add that just this past week, um, recipient of the 2018 John Chancellor Award for Excellence in Journalism was added to this growing list of accolades. So, congratulations. <laughs> As 
As an investigative journalist, Nicole Hannah-Jones has used her gift to capture the complex realities and lived experiences of Americans continue with, contending with racial injustice in the many structures of our society, including our education system. And her many awards speak to the powerful way her voice has resonated with writers, parents, students, and many of you in this room tonight. So when considering who we wanted to commence our first annual conversation on racial equity in North Carolina schools, she was the natural choice. So I am honored to introduce Nicole Hannah-Jones on behalf of the Sanford School of Public Policy as a rural North Carolinian who struggled through and excelled in our public schools. I believe improving racial, racial equity is a paramount and urgent issue facing our state and our country. This belief was also evident in the policies of Terry Sanford, Duke's prior governor of North Carolina and our president, who the Sanford School is named after and who we continue to proudly carry forth his legacy in civil rights today through our engagement work. Nicole Hannah-Jones' interviews and writing reminds us that addressing racial inequity requires under, undying commitment and ever evolving action. In one of her articles, she writes, if there is a benefit to having a, to fight for civil rights over so many decades, is that it makes you presciently aware of the way that racism does not so much go away, but adapts to the times. So I hope what I say next will be an encouragement and um, an expansion of what Keith um, encouraged you all to do earlier And that. I hope that while you're listening to Nicole Hannah-Jones speak tonight, that you will open your hearts and your minds to consider the, the ways that racism penetrates our society and explore actions to ending its perpetuation. So please help me welcome tonight's speaker. Back to our state, because she was a Tar Heel down the road not too long ago, but we won't hold that against her. Join me in giving a round of applause for Nicole Hannah-Jones. Good evening. Um, thank you all for coming out tonight. Of course, this is a bit of a homecoming. I lived here for six years. I clearly have my Tar Heel button on because I am in enemy territory. <laughs> and I also began my career and my interest in covering education because my very first job was working in the Durham Bureau of the News and Observer covering the Durham Public Schools. I started covering them in 2003, which for those of you who follow education is right when the penalty phases of No Child Left Behind started to kick in. And I was spending my time in schools where every single kid was black and every single kid was poor and administrators and teachers were working their asses off and were unable clearly to produce the same results of schools where only 10% or 20% of kids were living in poverty and that had every resource in the world. That's when I began to understand that something was fundamentally wrong and that our embracing of separate but equal, which is what No Child Left Behind was, No Child Left Behind said we are not going to try to break up these segregated high poverty schools. We're just going to test them to death and hold them accountable. And if we hold them to high standards for the first time in the history of America, we will finally make separate equal. We all know how that turned out. No Child Left Behind no longer exists. And we have implemented reform after reform after reform that promises to do what we have never done. So if this gives you a sense of how the speech is going to go tonight, that would be good. Uh, before I start, though, I, I'd like to thank all of the staff who uh, moved the chairs, who prepared the food that we eat, who cleaned this venue. My grandmother was a domestic. She was one of those uh, who had the invisible hands that made everything work but never got any acknowledgement. So I'd like to thank everyone who did that. And now I'm just going to give you all a bit of a warning. Some of you may have followed my work, some of you may have not, but if you read my work, you know my work is not hopeful or inspirational. So if you came here tonight looking for inspiration, wrong speech. I don't think they'll give you, I don't know if you paid any money, but if you paid it, you probably can't get it back. Um, <laughs> because I, I don't want you to feel inspired, I want you to feel ashamed. I want us to leave here understanding fully that we're in a country, and particularly an area, the research triangle, with vast material wealth 
and with vast resources, and we don't have to have kids in the schools getting the education that they're getting. And when we do that, it's a choice. So I want us to leave understanding that we make a choice. So I'm just going to start with a little reminder to center us in what we're actually talking about. And we're actually talking about children. These are some of the children that I've met through my reporting. These are children who have attended um, schools that look like Brown v. Board of Education never happened. These are children who have spent 13 years in public schools without ever having attended school with a child of another race and almost never having attended school with a child who wasn't also living in poverty. Because I'm going to go and we're going to go through a lot of history and I'm going to throw data points at you, but I want you to understand that between behind all of that are actual children and that that's who I am writing for and fighting for, and that's who this organization is fighting for. And I assume if you're here in this room, this is who you want to fight for as well. So when we think about education, we think about the ideal, that when we begin this country, that what was going to make us different from Europe was we were going to be a classless society. We were going to invest in common schools for the common good, with the understanding that schools can be the great equalizer, as the father of public schools said, of the conditions of man. That schools could be the place where it didn't matter what your parents did for a living, how much money you had, you would be able to go into the doors of a school that would be funded by your neighbors, and you'd be able to receive an education that would allow you to change your life. But of course, if that actually were true, I wouldn't be here today giving you this speech. I think the truth is probably closer to this which historian James Anderson said, from the beginning, we've always had two systems of education, one for oppression, or excuse me, one for democracy, which is the education we have largely reserved for white children, and one for oppression, which is the education we have largely reserved for children of color. Because if you know the story of Horace Mann, when he decides in Massachusetts that he is going to attempt to get support for a common school movement, he makes a compromise. And he makes the compromise that we have been making ever since, which is that in order to get white support for these common schools, he had to ensure that black children would not be educated in them. That was the promise that he made. Now, he didn't actually believe that black children shouldn't be educated. He believed that all children should be educated. But he was willing to sacrifice those children for the larger goal, believing that once you convinced white people to support common schools, you could later bring black children into those schools as well. I start with that because I think it's important that if you study history, you will understand our schools are not broken. Our schools are actually operating exactly as they were designed. And if you come from that standpoint of understanding that from the founding of common schools in this country, it was never intended for black children to get the same quality of education as white children, then you understand the work ahead is not going to be about small fixes and little patches. That is going to have to require an undoing of the entire way that we structure education and equality. And if you're not in it for that, well, I don't want you to leave because I don't want this to empty out. <laughs> but you really have to question your commitment to the work ahead. So we're going to go back. People who know my work know my, my, my like, lifelong ambition is to get slavery in my stories, which I haven't yet. Um, but my book is going back to slavery, so I'm going to get there. But what I realized is most Americans, we don't know very much about our history at all. And when it comes to the history of race, we have downright amnesia. So a timeline, I think, is helpful if we want to understand why is this so hard? Why 60 years, almost 65 years after Brown v. Board of Education, are we still dealing with this? It's because we need to understand that this is who we are as a country. If you look at the timeline, the English land at Jamestown in 1607, and it takes us only 12 years to import Africans to be enslaved. We are not even a country yet. We are only a colony. And it only takes us 12 years before we've decided there will be a caste of people who will not be citizens, who will not be treated, who can be bought and sold. If you understand that, then you understand that racism is in the DNA of our country. It is not a feature of our country. It is in the fiber of our country. 
it would take us another 150 years before we decide we even want to become our own country when we declare independence from Great Britain. I wonder how many of you, since we're on a college campus, have ever read the original Declaration of Independence as drafted by Thomas Jefferson? Anyone? Anyone want to recite it? Just playing. <laughs> the original Declaration of Independence actually speaks about the institution of slavery. And in that original draft, Thomas Jefferson castigates the uh, British for introducing slavery into the colonies. He says that slavery is a great evil, and he understands the hypocrisy of trying to start what you say will be the most freest country that the world has ever seen, the greatest democratic republic the world has ever seen, while holding a fifth of your population in bondage with no legal or civil or human rights. Unfortunately, in order to get enough signers to that declaration, he has to remove that passage. And of course, we all know that Thomas Jefferson himself owned human beings, including his own children, and he would own those human beings until the day he died. So the declaration that ultimately um, starts our country is a declaration that allows for the bondage of a fifth of the population. And it would continue until 90 years later when we have to fight the bloodiest war in the history of our country in order to end the institution of slavery. Now, I know I'm in the South, so I'm just going to make this clear in case anyone isn't sure. The Civil War was fought about slavery, OK? Now, some might argue it was states' rights, and I say yes, the states' right to own slaves. So let's just be real. So this institution nearly tears our country apart. We finally fight this war, and we end slavery. And then we immediately, after a brief period of Reconstruction, enter into another 100 years of legal apartheid known as Jim Crow. It is not until 1968, with the passage of the last great civil rights legislation, the Fair Housing Act, that black Americans get full citizenship rights in the country of their birth, in the country of their grandparents' birth, their great-grandparents' birth, and their great-great-grandparents' birth. Those of you whose ancestors came over in the 1970s or the 1960s or the 1950s or the 1940s, if you were white, your ancestors could come here and immediately have more rights than black people whose ancestors had gone back 100 or 200 or 300 years. So when you understand that history, it's not surprising that we still struggle. Then we have 1976, which I would consider the greatest event in all of American history, I was born. <laughs> I don't know why y'all are laughing. You see where I got my uh, affinity for big hair? Now, if there are some historians in here, they may disagree that that was one of the great events in American history, but this is my speech, so I can say that. But I point that out because I was born in 1976. I am part of the first generation of black people in this country born into a country with full legal rights. This is not ancient history. Let me say that one more time. I am in the first generation of black people in the history of this country who was born with full legal citizenship rights. So when we want to say, why do you keep thinking about the past? Why don't people get over it? Why isn't everything OK? When you understand that, then you understand that it's been a very, very short time where black people have even had the legal right. And that's not making up for 400 years of not being able to earn income, not having um, the ability to control your own schools, not having the ability to live where you want to live, not having the ability to build wealth. So less than 10 years before I was born, it was perfectly legal to deny someone like myself housing because of the color of my skin. 10 years before I was born, it was illegal for me to exist in North Carolina and many southern states because my mother is white and my father is black. 15 years before I was born, it was perfectly legal for me to be denied access to a public library or a public pool or a restaurant or a school. So when you look at that, and I know I look very, very youthful, um, when you understand that, that my father, not just my grandmother or my great-grandmother, that my father was born in Greenwood, Mississippi in 1945 without rights. He had to be delivered in the shack on the cotton uh, plantation where his family were sharecroppers because the hospital did not serve black people. 
this is not ancient history that we're talking about. And we've done very, very little to address this past. Don't look at me a little longer. I was cute. So if we go all the way back to slavery, and we think about that in this country, there's only been one group of people where it was illegal to teach us to read. Black people are the only people in the history of the United States where it was against the law to teach us to read, and it was against the law for us to be able to write. Then you understand why we still struggle to have educational equality. Because why would one deny an entire race of people the right to read and write? It is because you understand that it is hard to control a people who is able to read and to write and to think and to process information. That once people began to have an education, they begin to question their circumstance. One of the biggest fears, of course, was abolitionist literature, literature being written by enslaved people who had run away that was challenging the system. It was also the fear of even the Bible, because while uh, enslavers like to teach the passages about slave obey their master, they didn't really want black people reading the passages about uh, Israel's fleeing slavery, right? So as I've been researching for my book and trying to draw this connect, uh, direct line between the struggle for educational equality that black people experience now and the struggle for educational equality that we have always experienced, I've been going back and reading the slave narratives. And what you realize is that one of the most pernicious myths in American society is that black people are the only people in the history of the world who don't value an education. We hear that all the time. Black kids aren't doing well because their parents don't value education, and neither do they. But nothing could be further from the truth. When you're reading from people who had been beaten, who had been sexually assaulted, who had had their children sold away from them, and over and over again, what they keep saying is the thing they could not forget was being deprived of their education. And that despite the fact that you could be whipped, you could have your fingers cut off, and you could be killed, for learning to read or teaching other enslaved people to read, people still did it anyway. So this myth about black people not valuing education arises to serve a purpose, because then it justifies the poor quality of education that black people are receiving. Because for black people, literacy has always been about liberation. It hasn't been about how much money can you make. It has been about will you be free or not. One of the biggest fear that enslavers had was that black people were going to write their own path to freedom, which they did. So we start with a system that doesn't believe that black people should receive an education at all. What's also not commonly known is that public schools come to the South because black people bring them. When black people are uh, released from slavery, they are in many cases refusing to work unless their children are educated. They are putting together their pennies and building their own schools. There are, at that time, no common schools or public schools for white children. The only children, really, who were receiving an education were children of the gentry. So the white gentry would pay for their own children to go to private school, but poor white children had no school whatsoever. And as I've been researching, I found all of these incidents where black people formed a school, and white, poor white people would send their children to that school because it was the only school that they could get for their kids. So. Even in the 1870s and 1880s, you were seeing integrated schools because white people didn't care if their kids were in black schools if that was the only school around. It's only after the end of Reconstruction where a lot of these schools began to get destroyed and states start to implement in their constitutions bars on integrated education that we see the complete uh, segregation of common schools. So we have uh, uh, approximately 70 years of that and then overnight, the Supreme Court rules in Brown v. Board of Education that segregated schools are unconstitutional. And I think for most of us who have only lived in America where that ruling has been, we don't actually understand how radical that was. That nine justices of the Supreme Court overnight say racial apartheid in schools is illegal. And what they're really saying is that the Southern way of life can no longer stand. Because the under what white Southerners understood was this ruling would not just be about schools. That if segregation was unconstitutional in schools, it was going to be unconstitutional in every other aspect of American life. 
So we're gonna go through some photos. This very cute little girl, some of you may recognize her. Her name is Ruby Bridges. She's wearing these cute bobby socks in her very adult attache case. <laughs> and in this photo, she's about two years younger than my own daughter. Now, Ruby Bridges was the first black child to attend a white elementary school in the South. And these gentlemen standing around her are the white US Marshals who have to protect her from the white mob that is trying to keep her from going into the school that her parents are paying taxes to run as well. I show these photos because I think we forget how violently school integration was resisted. And because we forget how violently school integration res was resisted, not by people who were wearing KKK costumes, but by these white mothers who clearly consider themselves good people, if we understand that history, then we understand why we still struggle. So this here is a makeshift casket that the mothers made and put a little brown baby doll in that casket and they would march that casket past six-year-old Ruby Bridges as she was trying to enter the school each day. But what we know of the story is Ruby Bridges spent uh, her first semester of her school in a classroom with just her and her teacher because all of the white parents pulled their kids out of the class with her. These are kids in Tennessee at the first uh, high school, black, white high school to be integrated in the South. I'll show you a picture later on. Uh, that high school got blown up. I think a lot about the courage it took for the parents to put their children through that, not just for themselves, but for all black children in their community. At a time when black parents understood that it wasn't just about getting something for your own child, but of trying to better the circumstances for every child in your community. I try to imagine bringing my daughter to taunt other children. This is the high school that got bombed. White people were willing to bomb their own schools rather than let a handful of very carefully selected black children enter those schools. This is in um, Prince Edwards County where they shut down the entire school system for five years rather than let black children go to the schools that their parents were also paying taxes to fund. Uh, the white children got to go to school on vouchers to segregation academies and the black kids got no school unless their parents moved them out of town. And then once the kids got access to the schools, it's not like everything was rosy inside. Many of them didn't make it through the school year. This is Boston. I always make sure I show Boston because uh, up north, white progressives love to look down on the south. And they love to tell me, I can't believe how backwards they are down there. Then I show them Boston and then we move on. <laughs> the judge in Boston rules that the segregation in the North is also de jure segregation, that it is also segregation by law and by, well, not by law, but by official policy, and so that those schools must integrate as well. Imagine ever a time in the country where white people had to assert they had rights, okay. Of course, our um, National Guardsmen who are called out to escort children into schools. This is probably one of the most famous photos. Okay, we get the gist, right? So a quick timeline. I find that there's, most of us aren't taught very much about Brown. How many of you were taught in your K-12 education about Brown Bee Board? So about half. If it's mentioned at all, it's typically taught in a way, we say it happened, and then we're just left to believe that uh, all the white people repented, <laughs> held hands with black people, saying kumbaya, and then we integrated the schools, or we're taught that everybody had to get on buses, and buses messed everything up, and we couldn't do it, and so we had to move on. 
none of that's really true, of course. Um, the South, as I said, this is a, a radical ruling, and the South rebels. The South says that this is an illegitimate court, and it does not have to comply. It enters into massive resistance, where it simply says it will not comply with the orders of the Supreme Court, and for 10 years, it doesn't have to. Now, North Carolina was a little smarter, and were much more savvy. North Carolina was like, we're going to take the segregation laws off the books. We have now complied. Or they would send maybe one black child into a white school. That school is now desegregated. It's no longer an all-white school. And it actually worked for a long time. But a decade after Brown, only 1% of children, black children in the South, are attending a desegregated school. For 10 full years, the South is allowed to defy the mandate of the highest court in the land. And then a couple things happen. The 1964 Civil Rights Act is passed, and for the first time, um, it allows the federal government to sue school districts to force them to desegregate. Prior to that, the Legal Defense Fund was having to go and sue every individual school district. It's a small civil rights organization. It couldn't do it. It also ties, for the first time, federal funding to racial discrimination. And so school districts can be stripped of federal funds, but also they'd still get sued anyway. And then the Supreme Court starts to get its act together with a series of ruling that says it's not enough to simply take desegregation off of the books or to let a handful of black kids into white schools. You actually have to desegregate. You have to mix the kids up. And the desegregation has to include everyone from the principals, the teachers, down to the cafeteria workers and the custodians. Once the federal government gets its act together, the dominoes in the South fall very rapidly. And as you see, by the early 1970s, it only takes about six years to go from almost complete apartheid until uh, most black kids in the South are attending desegregated schools. There's two things that that tells us. One, we can make integration happen. Two, only if we force it. So the South becomes transformed. Every five years ago or so, a new study comes out about where the most segregated schools are in the country. And then everyone gasps because they're like, New York City has some of the most segregated schools in the world. Who knew? And I'm like, we've known that for 50 years. The South has been the most integrated part of the country for the last 45 years. The South does not get credit for that because the South became integrated because it was forced to integrate by the courts. But it has been, and it remains, the most integrated part of the country for black children. And it's actually the Northeast and the Midwest, which have never really had successful court order desegregation, that remain the most segregated parts of the country for black children. New York State being the most segregated state uh, in the country for black children, and California being the most segregated state in the country for Latinos, two of the bluest states in the country. So desegregation worked if you are considering the achievement gap. It's actually re worked remarkably well. These are a map of national um, MAPE scores. The red line across the top are white reading scores. The black line across the bottom are the reading scores of black children. And you'll see that starting in 1971, which is the earliest that we have this data, when you have this period of rapid resegregation, the achievement gap between black and white children closes very quickly. As a matter of fact, in less than 15 years, it's cut in half. And then it starts to widen again. And it's closed some, but it's never gotten back to that narrow point. So what happens in 1988? 1988 is the year we start to see resegregation. It's the year we start to see a reversal. Now, if you do the math on that, we start real desegregation in 1964. 1988, not quite a full generation. We've already decided we've done enough. We start to see court orders being closed out. We start to see school districts, once again, being able to implement policies that lead to segregation. And by 1988, black children are beginning to get more segregated again, and the achievement gap widens. And if you look back at this, you'll know that in this timeline, there have been a host of school reforms. There's been no child left behind. There's been race to the top. There's been expansion of charter schools. There's been vouchers. You name it. But nothing has closed that racial achievement gap, like actually getting black and white kids in the same classrooms together, and poor and wealthier kids in the same classrooms together. So what happens is the South is forced to um, integrate by court order. You never have 
massive desegregation outside of the South. And then the judges began to dismiss these court orders. The Reagan administration, the Justice Department switches sides and decides it is no longer in favor of desegregation. We need to start closing these orders down. The Bush administration continues that policy. And as soon as school districts are released from their court orders, they immediately began to do things that resegregate schools. And what does that tell you? That tells you that this is intentional. Because I think we like to pretend that the inequality that we see is just a matter of the past, or incidental, or black people are poor, and so they're more likely to live in poor black neighborhoods, and that's why schools are segregated. But it's not actually the case. So this is a map of uh, the most rapidly resegregating districts in the country. You'll see Charlotte is on there, sadly in Carolina blue. If you look on that axis on the left, this is a dissimilarity index. So the higher the number, the more segregated a school district is. The zero point is the point at which schools will be perfectly integrated. And the higher you go, the more racially isolated black students are. The zero point on the bottom is a point at which all of these school districts were released from their court order desegregations. So what you see is when they are under the orders of a court and forced to do things to integrate, they are stably integrated. You also see that literally as soon as they are released from the court order, segregation spikes. And that is because school boards are then intentionally doing things to resegregate their schools. Or as a case in Charlotte, they're being forced by the courts. So Charlotte's busing plan is ended. They're forced to go back to a neighborhood school. Uh, assignment policy, residential areas are segregated, so the schools become segregated. Excuse me. And so what happens is we start to see black children being more segregated. What this map shows is the percent of black children in majority white schools. There's two things you'll see on this map. One, never in the history of, uh, at least since we've been able to measure it, have black children attended, half of black children attended majority white schools. So in a country where black people are about 13% of the population, we've not had a point where even half of black kids have attended majority white schools. And you'll see that where we are now, black children are as segregated now as they were in the 1970s. So we are literally moving back in time. So the message that I hope we all understand in this particular region is because the South is the only place that is ever truly desegregated, and because even now, this is a place where black children are the most likely to t attend an integrated school. If we lose the South, we lose the country. There is no real integration occurring, except in parts of the West where the black population is fairly small. Now, I was happy when the South lost the Civil War. I prefer the South doesn't lose this one. But the South is now looking to the North on different strategies to resegregate its schools. One of the reasons that court order desegregation worked in the South is most uh, school districts in the South were countywide. So desegregation orders um, were involving the city, the suburbs, and the rural areas. It's much easier to mix students that way. But in the north, you may have 20 school districts serving one metro area. And the way that white people avoided desegregation in the north was simply move five miles up the road to an all-white community with its all-white schools. And the desegregation orders, because of the, a ruling by the Supreme Court in 1974, were not able to cross municipal lines. So now the North, the South, is starting to do that same type of thing. So I did a story last year about school districts outside or communities outside of Birmingham. They were trying to succeed from their larger diverse school districts. And we're starting to see more and more communities trying to break off from diverse school districts and form more white small school districts. So what we're seeing across the South as you saw, a sharp drop in racial isolation. And now we're seeing that increasing and also increasing for Latinos as a Latino population in the South grows. And then white students are also, of course, um, experiencing resegregation as well. And in North Carolina, the number of racially isolated schools, North Carolina has always been a fairly moderate state. 
It was not like the southern states refusing to desegregate at all, but we're starting to see growing numbers of uh, black kids in racially isolated and economically isolated schools. And then the, the double segregation, which is the worst segregation, where they are uh, isolated by both race and class. And then, of course, what's different about North Carolina is in many places, charter schools are going into poor black and Latino communities. But in North Carolina, charter schools are being used for segregation. They are providing the escape hatch for white parents. Uh, I'm going to give you all a little bit of lecture on school choice in a second, because a lot of progressive people have laid the groundwork for the expansion of charter schools that are segregating kids. Oh, OK. Hot topic, huh? All right, so I quizzed you guys on the Declaration of Independence. Now, how many of you guys have read the Brown v. Board of Education ruling? It's only the most important Supreme Court ruling of the 20th century, but that's OK. Uh, most of us have never read an entire Supreme Court ruling. Until I started writing about school segregation, I had never read the Brown v. Board of Education ruling either. But it matters for a reason. Because most people think, because they've never actually read the ruling, that Brown v. Board of Education is about resources. They believe that it is about the inferior schools that black people were attending. And because they believe that, we're kind of OK with segregation now, because we say we can just get those black schools the same resources and everything will be OK. But if you read the Brown v. Board of Education ruling, it only mentions resources to say that the South had already begun equalizing resources in black schools. Because you see, white Southerners had seen the writing on the wall. The Supreme Court had begun ruling against segregation in higher education. And they were understanding that if they didn't start fixing up these black schools, there was going to be a much larger ruling overturning segregation altogether. So they were trying very hard at the end to actually comply with the separate part or the equal part of separate but equal. What the court is actually talking about in this ruling is racial caste and citizenship. And what it says is that in a country built on racial caste, separate cannot be made equal. That separate serves a purpose, and that is to keep black people in second class status. And it understands that to be full citizens of a democracy, a racial minority cannot be separate from the ruling class. There's another thing that the Brown really doesn't talk about, and that's test scores. We have become obsessed with test scores. The only thing we want to talk about now is whether the school has high test scores or not. But of course, that's because test scores work as a proxy for race. And it's very convenient for us to say, I'm not putting my child in that school because of test scores, because it's not really cool to say you don't want to put your kid in a black school. But Brown doesn't mention test scores at all. And when you all think about your own lives, you don't go apply for a job and tell them what your test scores were. They're not relevant. Education is about much more than that. But when it comes to inequality, that's the only thing we want to focus on. And that's for our convenience. What the Brown rules, what that court rules, is that separate is inherently unequal. That means that it cannot be made equal. So we have to ask ourselves, why do we believe that this picture on the left, which was before Brown v. Board of Education, that's Linda Brown right there, we say that that was wrong, but this is OK. Everyone can admit that that was wrong, but most of us are perfectly fine sustaining this today. <clears throat> This picture here is the Bronx, New York. And this picture here is Tuscaloosa, Alabama. It's not a regional problem. Wherever you find large numbers of black kids, we are segregating those kids, and we are separating them from opportunity and equality. The truth is, we've never made separate equal in this country for a single day. I have spent 15 years writing about these issues. I have looked at. Study after study, I have looked at the data that is collected by the US Department of Education, and I have yet to find a single community where the black schools don't get less. Not one. And every time I give a talk, I challenge the audience 
Show me the one place in America where black kids segregated in their own schools get the same thing as white kids in their own schools, and no one yet has been able to prove me wrong. And I would imagine that doesn't surprise any of you, and it doesn't surprise any of you because that's how racial caste works. We don't expect that black kids will get the same things, and so they do not. So to this day, you can go to the US Department of Education Civil Rights Database Collection, and you'll see that in anything important that you measure, the more black kids in that school, the less that school has. And you can be in a rural area, a suburban area, an urban area. You can be in any region of the country, and that holds true. What's worse is that segregated schools actually exacerbate inequality. So here we believe that schools are the great equalizer. But what the data shows is the longer a black child stays in a segregated school, the further and further that child falls behind. So instead of closing the gap, our schools are widening the gap for black children. Instead of allowing black children to go in the doors and transform their lives, we are putting black kids in schools that ensure that where they started is where they're going to end. And much more important than achievement gaps because to be honest, I don't care if black children ever score the same as white kids on a biased standardized test. That's a terrible measure. It's a terrible measure of a child's ability. It's not a measure at all of a child's worth. And it's also not a measure of the education that child is receiving or what an education is supposed to do. Horace Mann did not say that schools or education is the equalizer of all test scores. What he says is that it is supposed to be the equalizer of the conditions of mankind, right? And what the longitudinal data shows is that when the Supreme Court rules in a 9 to 0 unanimous ruling to overturn segregation in schools, because segregation in schools solidifies racial caste, it knew exactly what it was talking about. Rucker Johnson, uh, economist out of Cal Berkeley, has studied 30 years of longitudinal data of black children who in the 70s got access to desegregated schools. And what it shows is those schools changed the entire trajectory of their lives. Now, much more than test scores, those children were more likely to graduate high school, to go to college. They were less likely to live in poverty. They were less likely to go to jail. And more important than that, they passed that on to their own children. Those benefits went to the next generation. Children who attended segregated schools had the opposite effect, and they also passed along that to their next generation of children. So educators in this room know, sociologists in this room know, there's only been one thing that's ever worked on scale to close the racial achievement gap and to also bring around about societal equality or as close to it as we've gotten in this country for black kids. If that is the one thing that is always automatically off the table. We'll give those schools more money. We'll break those schools up into four small high schools, like that was the problem, right? We'll do all of these other reforms, but we can't speak the name of the one thing that works. And that is actually getting black and white kids into the same classrooms together. Integration has been off the table, and we have to ask ourselves why. That's not the reason that I ever hear. I hear lots of excuses. Politically, it's not possible. If you force white people to do this, they'll leave the district. It's too hard. People have to get on buses. You know, what's funny is Linda Brown sued for the right to go to her neighborhood school. We were fine with busing for segregation. Busing only becomes a problem when we use it for integration. And kids ride buses every single day. I can tell you in New York City, White parents put their kids on the train for an hour each way to get them to a good school and would not even consider putting their kids in their neighborhood school. So as they used to say back in the 70s, it's not the bus, it's us, right? So you hear all these excuses about why we cannot integrate our schools. But what you never hear is that we shouldn't do it because it's not what's best for children. And if it's what's best for children, why aren't we doing it? I think that when we look at where we are and the struggle for education and public education in North Carolina tonight, I was astounded to hear that 
only 80% of children in the state now attend a public school. Nationally, it's 90%. What that tells you is that it, as we have tried to is get our children choice so that we can escape schools with kids we don't want our children by, we have sown the seeds for the undoing of public education altogether. Because when I say I have a right not to go to my neighborhood school, I have a right not to be bused to the school, I have a right to choose, you are introducing the market into a public good. And then where does that end? Because now why shouldn't I have the right to take my tax dollars and put them in a private school? Why shouldn't I have a right to take my tax dollars and put them in a charter school? So even those who believe that they're on the quote unquote right side have sown the seeds for the destruction of public education. And it's because we have stopped talking about public schools as a common good. And instead we started talking about them as an individual good. What about my child? What is my child going to get? Well, I say, if you can pay for it, your child can get everything. But if they can't, then your child doesn't actually deserve more on the public dime than any other kid gets. And so if you think you're going to win the fight for public education with these segregated schools, I'm going to be like the kids after the Parkland shooting I call bullshit. It's not going to happen. Inequality drives the people to opt out of the public system. Inequality allows charter schools to come into your communities because people are looking for escape hatches out of this unequal system. And actually, if you truly believe in the idea of public schools, then that idea is that we're all in this together. And the idea of public schools is not that those who already have the most continue to also get the most in a public school, and those who already have the least will go to schools that have the least. That's the system that we sustain right now. Because now when we talk about this, we talk about words that I hate, like diversity, which are meaningless. Integration is a term of justice. Integration is something that feels good. You can have a sprinkling of this and a sprinkling of that, and it doesn't fundamentally change the system. What we're talking about in a place like Durham, which is a majority black school system now, but where most white kids don't attend schools that look like the rest of the school system. We look at what has happened in Wake County, which had long been the example that scholars used all over the country about a place that tried and that where it worked. And we've seen the destruction of that effort there as well. Then we can look to a place like Chicago or New York where white people have completely pulled out of the public school system altogether. So this is really the crux of it. As I imagine, if I asked any of you in this room, do you believe in equality, you'd all say yes, except when it comes to your own children. Then, all of a sudden, your kids deserve more than the other people's kids. And I understand that. But I think if we're going to actually believe in public schools and a public good and a common good, Sometimes we have to make decisions that are not just about us, and especially those who generationally have been advantaged in this country, who generationally have had exclusive access to the best public schools and the best education and the best neighborhoods and the best jobs. What do you give up so that those who have not had access to those things can get access to those things? Because in a country built on racial caste, equality means those who have had unearned advantage have to give some of that up. And trust me, I know that's the hardest thing. This is probably the piece I'm most well known for. I understand that it's easy to have morals and values until you have to live them. When they're abstract, it's very easy. I started my public education reporting career right here in the Durham Public Schools. And I would be talking to other reporters and I'd be talking to activists who were all working on this issue and were appalled by the inequality in the schools. And then I'd ask them, well, where do your kids go to school? Every last one of them, their kid was in a disproportionately white and a disproportionately wealthy school and they wouldn't think of putting their kids in the schools with the kids that they were writing about. 
and I was young at that point, and I didn't even wasn't thinking about kids. And I remember thinking, I don't want to be like that when my time comes. But it was easy because I didn't have a child. Then I have my daughter, and I moved to New York City, one of the most segregated and unequal school districts in the country, where at two years old, I was already being asked, what are you going to do with your child? Because you definitely can't put your child in your neighborhood school. And it was time for me to decide what was I going to do with my own child. And who knows better than me the way the segregated schools harm our children. Yet I also understood that if all of us avoid these schools because they're not good enough for our kids, then we are choosing to sustain those schools for other people's kids. And if they're not good enough for our own kids, whose children are they good enough for? So this article talks about my decision to enroll my daughter in a 95% black and Latino, 90% free and reduced lunch school in New York City. It also talks about the arguments my husband and I had about that decision once I told him I had made it. <laughs> <laughs> and it talks about the fear we had as parents because of course, our, we all want to do what's best for our children. But do we not also want to do what's best for other people's children? And I knew that I could give my child every advantage. I'm a New York Times reporter. Both myself and my husband have been to college. My daughter went to Hawaii when she was four months old. Our house is full of books. We go to museums. We can give her everything. But for the kids in my daughter's school, the chance to get a quality public education might be the only advantage they will ever get in life. And those of us with privilege think we deserve to take that too. So when I tell you that, yes, inequality is structural, it is also upheld by our individual choices about what we do with our own kids. And to be clear, because I always get this question, so no one should ask me this at the q and I'm going to answer it now. My daughter's doing great, because my daughter is a child in school with other children. She's not Ruby Bridges. It's not a sacrifice. I am not heroic. These are my neighbors. These are children who are like my family members back home. We need to stop being afraid of our kids. And we need to also understand that our children are not the only ones benefiting those schools, that those children benefit our children as well. Because I think we don't understand that. People tell me how lucky my daughter's classmates are to have her. And I tell them how lucky my daughter is to have them. And I know this personally because I was the black kid who got bused into white school starting in the second grade. I was the kid who my classmates' parents were afraid to have in the school because I came from the wrong side of town and I was the wrong color. But what I can tell you is I'm also the only MacArthur genius that ever came out of Waterloo, Iowa, OK? <laughs> So all those assumptions that we have about kids, our kids are not lacking. Their opportunities are lacking. And if we believe in them and if we share our resources with them, it is amazing the things that they can accomplish. It is amazing the things that my daughter comes home and tells me about the things that she talks about with her classmates. <clears throat> so here's the question. When I wrote the piece about my daughter, I never expected it would have the impact that it had. And I heard from so many parents who said, I'm now having to think about the choices I've made for my own child. I'm going to be making a different choice. And then I heard from a small contingent of parents who told me, how dare you sacrifice your own daughter? Your daughter's not an experiment. You're going to regret what you've done to her. And I'm going to leave you guys with the question that I responded to them, because I do respond to all the emails, no matter how hateful. And I asked them, whose children do we sacrifice then? And I think we all need to ask ourselves, whose children are we choosing to sacrifice every day? Because we are choosing it. I'm in a 
particularly bitter point in my life. I've spent the last year working on my book, embedded in the poorest high school in Detroit, which is the poorest major city in the country and the lowest performing district in the country. One, less than one out of 10 kids in Detroit is proficient in reading and math. And at my high school, it's about 4%. And I've seen kids who come into a school every day without textbooks, who've gone an entire year without a math teacher, who have to come in and wipe rat feces off their desk because when the window breaks, there's no one there to fix the window, who can't drink out of the water fountains because they're full of lead, who've breathed in mold because they haven't been able to fix the schools. And they come into school and they misbehave. And I think to myself, you should be burning this school down. And then we say, see, they don't value their education. But the truth is, they look at their school every day and see how little we value their education. <laughs> it's one thing to be poor because everybody in your country is poor. It's quite something else to live in one of the wealthiest countries in the world, and you can't even get a textbook. There's a certain denigration to that that I think most people don't understand. And the way that segregation works so beautifully, most people never have to see what we're doing to those kids. You get on the highway and you drive past their, those neighborhoods, you never go into the doors of those schools and see what those kids are getting. And then we blame them for somehow not being able to overcome all of these obstacles that we've put in their place. Those are the kids that I spend my time with. And I've been going back through my notes as I'm writing my book and reliving all of the things that I saw. And kids who were saying to me, we know we don't mean anything. We know we don't matter. Why should I come to school when I can't even read? So I'm going to leave by telling you the story about one of the kids whom we decided to sacrifice. And then I'm going to ask us to make a different choice. So this is Delisha. You saw her as my very first slide. I met Delisha in 2013 when I was doing a story about resegregation in the South as school districts were being released from their court orders. She's in Tuscaloosa. Tuscaloosa did not comply with the desegregation order until 1988 had fought that order for 20 years. In 1988, a judge finally ordered the school district to integrate its schools by merging the black middle school and the white school, middle school into one school and the black high school and the white high school into one high school. So if you were a public school student in that town, you went to the same school from sixth to 12th grade. I actually thought that was kind of brilliant. But a lot of white people didn't want to go to an integrated school. So a lot of white people left the school district. And the powers in the town felt like they were losing opportunities. They lost a Mercedes, not a Mercedes Benz. It was a Volkswagen plant because uh, the white people didn't feel like they could move to the town and have a school where they would be in the majority. And so they fought to get that school desegregation order dismissed. And as soon as that desegregation order was dismissed, they created an all-black feeder system of schools and then a feeder system of schools that would be majority white. And then they promised that they were going to treat the black schools just like the white schools. Everything the white schools got, the black school was going to get. Now raise your hand if you think they actually did that. Are y'all cynical or just afraid to raise your hand? Realistic. Because of course they didn't. We know they didn't. We can predict that they didn't. So I meet Delisha in her senior year. This is the night she's crowned the homecoming queen. She had these huge dimples that immediately make you fall in love. She was the homecoming queen who was dating the football star. She was a state track champion athlete. She was on the mayor's youth council. She was an honor student. She was a class president. If she wasn't a black girl with a name like Delisha, we call her an all-American girl. But we never call girls with apostrophes in their names all-American. So when I met her, she had spent 13 years without ever having attended a school where 90% of kids weren't poor and 90% 99% of kids were black. She actually attended the exact same schools 
that her grandfather had attended when he started school in 1954 and graduated 13 years later without ever having attended an integrated school. She had big dreams when I first met her because at her school, she was everything. Then she went and took the ACT with the white kids from, she went to a test prep class with the white kids from across town. And she came back and that was the first time in the three months that I had followed her where her confidence was shaken. And she said, Miss Nicole, I sat in that class and those kids knew so much that I didn't know. That's because while the class, the school across town had 12 advanced placement courses, her school had none. Her school didn't have physics. It didn't have a newspaper, it didn't have a yearbook, it didn't have most of the things that that school across town had. So when she took her ACT for the first time, she got a 15. Now we're at Duke. We understand what a 15 means. She took it a second time and a third time, and the highest she could get on her test was a 16. And after she took it a third time, I asked her was she going to take it again, and she said, why would I take it again? I'm never going to be able to learn all that I need to know to get a score on this test to go to the University of Alabama, which was her dream. Those lights that you see back there are the stadium lights because the University of Alabama is two blocks from her high school. And she imagined because, I mean, I don't know if y'all ever been to Tuscaloosa, but they're a little crazy about football. Everybody down there is roll tide. It's very, it's very depressing. So she would talk to me about her dream to go to the University of Alabama, where her own mother had gone, her own mother who had gone to desegregated schools because of this court order. And she talked about how she was looking forward to, for the first time in her life, having discussions in class with kids who weren't just like her. That she wanted to discuss Shakespeare with kids who were Asian and white and Latino. She wanted to sit in the dorm room with kids who hadn't had the exact same experience with her. But there was no chance in hell with a 16 that she was getting into the University of Alabama, which requires a 21 on the ACT. And every day she would come home, and while most kids who had done all the things that she did would come home with their mailboxes brimming with letters from colleges recruiting them, she would come home, and most days there would be nothing. And some days there'd be a letter from the military. So Delisha learned at a very young age that you can do everything this country tells you to do. Everything right. And people who don't have your best interests, who don't believe that black children deserve the same education as white children, will deprive you of the ability to change your life. So Delisha applied to a historically black college and she got in. She's graduating, she's in her last year very proud of her, and I'm very supportive of Historically Black College. I think they are vitally important. I want my own daughter to go to Howard. But that's not what she wanted. That was not her dream. And so she will have graduated now attending 17 years of school in the United States of America without ever having attended school as a child who wasn't black. So. When I ask whose children are we willing to sacrifice, we've already sacrificed her. And there's children who attend schools close to this university who are sacrificing as well, because I spent a lot of time in Hillside High School. I spent a lot of time in these schools as well, reporting on the same issues 15 years ago that I'm reporting on now. And I've decided as I write my book, I'm not looking for the perfect child to tell the story through anymore. Because I picked the perfect child because I feel the only way I can get white people to care about black kids is they have to be perfect black kids who've never done anything. And I don't think you have to be perfect to get a good education in this country. So before I turn the slide, I just want you to look at her face one more time. Look at the hope on this night where the world seemed like it was hers. And then think about how it felt when she realized that as Julian Bond said, 
violence is going to school for 12 years, but only getting six years of education. And then I'm gonna leave you with Baldwin because Lord knows we should all be depressed to know he never goes out of style. <laughs> and I'm gonna ask how long are we gonna be talking about this shit? When are we going to actually decide that all of our children are worthy of the things that we demand for our own children? How much longer do our kids have to wait? How many more generations of kids are going to go to school and not be educated? The people in this room can do something about that. I think about the power of the triangle, which many places aren't lucky to have, three major universities that could be transforming these schools and do not. So it's all up to you guys. I don't want you to leave feeling good. I want you to leave feeling sick. I want you to leave and then call this organization and find out what can we do to actually ensure that the children in this community know that they matter and that they get the education that you fight for for your own children. And on that light note, I thank you all so much for your attention tonight. Thank you. Now, Nicole, well, first of all, thank you. Now, you said that um, I think you speak the truth, but you told us that you weren't um, going to be inspiring tonight, but I don't think that was true. Um, but she did say she would take some questions, and so we have some people in the audience with some microphones over here. We've got a couple out here in the audience. Here comes another one, Joanna. So if you want to raise your hand, and we'll get a microphone to you, um, uh, Nicole will be happy to take some questions. And please introduce yourself and, and you know, your connection here to the community. Questions? Oh, don't be shy. Hey. Hello. Uh, good evening. Oh. Hi, Nicole. Hi. Hi, Nikki. Um, thank you very much for gracing us with your presence. Um, yeah, I, I'm a little nervous. Um, Camilla Meek from the Regulator Bookshop, our independent bookshop here in Durham. Um, read your article last night. Um, it was very moving. Uh, one of the things I found most disturbing was um, the trend that you saw in New York City, which I also saw um, in Nashville, Tennessee, where I moved from, that um, as more white people moved into the inner, inner city, the historically black public schools um, were integrated and then became white. Um, the way Nashville handled it was by having uh, academic magnet public schools. I, I see this as a possible turning point in Durham's history too, that uh, we do have some magnet schools and there's more internal pressure as more and more affluent people move into Durham. I wonder if you'd comment on the phenomena. And then I would also like to share a workshop that's coming up with Richard Rothstein in two weeks about public education, if you don't mind. Yes, of course. Do you want to share it now? Sure. Um, if you Google Richard Rothstein uh, Durham, he is going to be here on October 15th doing a workshop based on his book, The Color of Law. It's on the, the state of public education. It's a um, 4 to 9 p.m. And there are still tickets available. So you should definitely check out Richard Rothstein. Um, his work is amazing. The book, The Color of Law, is is about how the government segregated housing. Um, and it's definitely been um, some of the work that I've relied on in my own reporting. So you remember that timeline that begins in 1607? I think that tells us how complicated this is going to be. Every solution you have has an unintended consequence. The solution of desegregation led to the purging of black teachers, black principals, the closing of black schools. Um, 
in my own daughter's school, which underwent uh, a rezoning that was supposed to integrate the school, we're also worried that what will happen is what always happens because white parents follow other white parents and the schools usually flip. And the black schools that are targeted for integration tend to be the high functioning black schools. They tend to be the schools that are actually serving the black children well, which is the only reason they believe they can get some white people to go into them. So I think what must be understood is the battle will never be won. It's gonna to have to be constant, uh, I don't wanna say fighting, but constant adaptation. It's always going to be a moving target. I, I feel very mixed about magnet schools because I think the message they send is that if you want white parents to come, you have to make the schools really good so black kids get what they get. Um, magnet schools originally were designed to be tools of integration, but now I find that they're tools that just replicate the racial hierarchy already in our system. They tend to be disproportionately white. Um, when I was in Durham, which was you know 15 years ago or so, they had wonderful magnets, but the magnets that were located in the black neighborhoods didn't get integrated. And I remember they did a parent survey and they were asking white parents, well, parents in general, but what they wanted and parents were like, we really want foreign language schools. Well, there was the IB elementary magnet that you wouldn't send your kids to. Or they really wanted a math specialization. Well, there was the math magnet, but you wouldn't send your kids there either. So fundamentally, it's not actually about the school. And what the research shows is white parents say that they're choosing schools based on test scores and other academic factors, but they're actually selecting schools based on the racial makeup and particularly how black the schools are. And they know this because they set up um, websites and had parents sit down and then they were able to actually track what were parents clicking on. And the first thing that white parents were clicking on were the demographics of the school. And what they found was even when the white schools had lower test scores and lower academics and lower ratings, they were picking the white school over the higher academic achieving black school. So what we have to get to is race. And until we deal with that issue, we cannot integrate our schools because white parents are choosing schools based on race and not academic quality, most, not all. Now, how do we fix that? I'd have about five MacArthur's if I could figure that out. <laughs> the blessing about being a journalist is I can just point out the problems and it's up to y'all to figure out how to fix them. Um, but one thing that I, I will say is true, and, 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 and I should have said this during my talk I usually do, I just wanna be clear for anyone who didn't get this from my talk. There's nothing magical about white people that makes black kids smart. Integration is necessary yeah, y'all can definitely clap for that. <laughs> Integration is necessary because it is the only way we have ever shown where black kids will get what we ensure white kids always get. That is why it matters. My daughter is in a segregated school and culturally it's amazing for her. And her experience is completely different from my experience where academically my education was great and culturally it was traumatic to be one of five black kids in an all white school. So until we, there, there are a number of white parents who have made a choice similar to mine. And I feel like the job is for those white parents to go out and educate other white parents. Because every time a white parent puts their child in a school like that, it makes it much harder for the white parent who says, I never could do that. And I have heard from dozens of white parents, some whose kids have only been in school for five years and some whose kids have graduated already, who were like, we put our kids in a school like that and our child was fine. Why are we shocked by this? So it's not really the job of black people to fix this. Black people didn't create the segregation. We don't want the segregation. We didn't benefit from the segregation. It's up for white people to figure out a way to fix this. So I can't tell you how, but I can tell you what you're doing wrong. Um, hello, thank you so much, Nicole, for such a moving and important message and for just engaging in the labor required to share it. 
Um, I am a, a new professor here at the Sanford School of Public Policy. You look young. Um, and I'm... I, <laughs> <laughs> Go, girl. <laughs> hey, thank you. I'll take that. Um, <laughs> um, and um, I, this question is definitely partial to my work. I'm really interested in public school closures. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, places like Chicago, Philadelphia, New York um, have had a record number of schools closed over the past couple of years yes. and disproportionately impact African-American communities. Um, and some of what we see in the work is that when you ask school officials sort of their justifications for these closures, they actually say and it's in the name of integration, that they're righting wrongs, that they're creating an opportunity for uh, African-American students to now, you know, go to schools with um, white, you know, students, although we haven't yet seen that um, yes. occur. So I'm really interested in your perceptions of that as a tactic. Um, if it even if it was done in sort of the right way. And then the other question is related to that. And it's just, um, I also would hear school officials say, and there's some political science research on this as well, that African American communities aren't as supportive of integration um, as they previously were. And if you could just comment, I have some ideas about that, but if you can comment on that sort of uh, critique as well. Yeah, sure. So you know this. The I haven't actually heard the argument that schools are being closed for integration because in Chicago, of course, New York, the schools are being closed and kids are being sent to other poor black schools. Um, and the research has shown that there's no academic improvement because they're being actually sent to schools that are identical to the schools that were closed. It's not like these schools are closed and they're suddenly being sent to high performing schools. Uh, I think school closures have been devastating um, in communities, often, uh, particularly in the poorest communities, those are the only functioning institutions in those communities. And for those to leave, um, I think does a lot of damage to the communities. And also, um, a lot of these families have such a hard time with transportation. So you begin to see attendance problems. You begin to see kids who are arriving to schools late. Um, again, I'm in Detroit, which has just been ravaged by uh, half of the schools are charters. There have been dozens of schools closed. And kids who have had to attend three to five schools in five years, they stop forming relationships with their teachers because they think you're going to be gone or I'm going to be gone. So I think it's been absolutely devastating. And I think the excuses have been uh, BS, because they're not closing them equally. When you look in Chicago, they were disproportionately closing schools in black areas. Um, and they were saying they were closing them for financial reasons, but black communities were bearing the brunt of that, which is a very similar history to desegregation. I think that. I don't think that integration will not be easy. It will not be easy on black kids. Um, it will cause some inconvenience for white families. I don't think we should expect that it'll be easy, but I think it should go both ways. So I think if you know black kids are being sent into white schools, white kids need to be sent into black schools too. I think what's been so unfair is that the burden has always been borne by the black families. That is also why you have seen black people um, who have gotten tired of the fight for integration. I think that they got tired of their kids always being bused. They got tired of going into white schools and their children were being suspended or their children were being tracked into lower classes. So clearly when I'm talking about integration, don't come talk to me about how proud you are to be in an integrated school and then all the advanced classes are white and all the black kids are in the lower classes. You get no credit for that. I'm talking about integration down to the classroom where kids are actually in the same classes together. Um, and I understand that. There is something demeaning about constantly feeling like you have to chase white people around who don't want to be around your children. But I also understand that, one, we are a, a small minority in a majority white country that is disproportionately run by white people in power. And to separate the poorest of our children from that power is to set them up for a life of disadvantage. And one thing I always tell black parents, if you are in this country, there will be a struggle for your child is which one. My parents chose to put me into white schools knowing that socially it was going to be very difficult. I knew I would never put my own daughter in that situation. I also didn't think I put her in an all black uh, segregated school either. Um, so maybe her academics aren't as great as another school, but culturally every day she's affirmed. So when we think about integration, it has to be what Dr. King said, which is it is a sharing of power. It is not just about letting a handful of black people into a white school that doesn't reflect their culture, that doesn't, the curriculum doesn't reflect them, but trying to create spaces 
where children can truly meet as equals. Now that, we can't even get us in the same building together. So I realize how hard that is, but if I'm asking for the impossible, I may as well just go for the gusto, right? It really is the right thing for our kids though. I mean, there's one white child in my daughter's class. There's been one white child in my daughter's class for the last three years. His name is Sam, he's her best friend. Sam is the most popular kid in, in the class. I kind of find him annoying, but the kids seem to love him. <laughs> and the, the interesting thing about his parents, and I always tell them, I'm like, I actually don't know white people like you, because they didn't do it for some social justice anything. They were like, it's a neighborhood school, and it's a good school. We're sending our kid to the school. If we can just come to think about it that way, and understand that Sam is going to be the man, right? Like he's going to have the most amazing life because he will have grown up understanding how little race actually means. I'm not even answering your question anymore. Now I'm just talking. Let me. Y'all are like, it's good. <laughs> you're like, don't give another speech up there. Okay, let's move on. Uh, oh. I'll keep my answer short. Uh, you're good. Thank you. Um, yes, hi, my name is Raja. I'm a current junior here at Duke. And so you mentioned how their research triangle has these three universities. Um, but as a Duke Four student, really well, yeah. Uh, so as a Duke student, um, you say these universities can um, interact in, with the community in ways that could really um, radically change Durham and Durham public schools, which have become majority minority. But I wonder how that works. Um, the relationship between um, very wealthy, very white universities and communities that are low income and majority minority, how do, how should Duke um, be approaching that relationship? Because in the past, it hasn't always been approached in a way that has been helpful for the community. Um, and so I wonder, would it be a bunch of rich white students that are working with these poor black kids and thinking that they're saving them, or how do you adjust it to where it's students actively both giving back to a community that they're spending their four years in and um, also like doing some good without thinking that they're like saving the world? Okay, so <laughs> what, what, what did you say you, what are you majoring in? <laughs> Um, I'm a psychology major, education minor. I'm also in the elementary teacher preparation program here. So I'm very excited about that because I think our kids need you and I think you come up with a solution and I'll help you implement it. Um, I don't have all the answers. I would never sit up here and say, I know how to fix everything. Everything is fraught, right? When you have a powerful, wealthy university and you're saying, help your local schools, that's fraught. Um, one of the things that I, I find in almost all of these towns I go in where there is a major university, is there are special public schools that the faculty go to, and then there's the rest of the schools. Uh, I would like to see that be a place to start. Um, this is a university that is surrounded, as many universities, because this is, if you understand the history of white flight, you can pick up a lot of institutions, but you can't move a university. So that's why universities are often remaining the last big uh, prominent institutions that remain in communities that have lost a lot of white population, which means they actually have a lot of power to change things. I think about um, how in a lot of these schools, uh, the low-income schools get the least experienced teachers, right? They, they struggle uh, to have advanced curriculum. What could a school like this do in terms of supporting teachers, in terms of supporting professional development, to at least ensure that if the kids are going to be segregated, can they get the best instruction? Because the kids can clearly learn if they're getting the best instruction. So I think that there's a lot that they can do, but I think you have to be very thoughtful. I don't believe in just going in and telling communities what they need. I would never deign to tell these communities exactly what they need. I think that's the work that has to be done on the ground, and I think you'd be a great person to help come up with some of those solutions. Thank you so much. We have a question over here, because we're going to have to, we have, again, we've got two questions, and that's going to be, we're going to have to cut it, because I want to make sure, I know it's a weeknight, school night, I guess, so I'll make sure you guys get <laughs> your question, then back here, and then... Um, 
We'll okay, I wrote down my things because I was very excited. Um, thank you for being you in this moment. I love your nails. Oh, thank you. I love your dress. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I went to New York City Public. Oh, I'm Angie Chandler from the Harvey B. Gantt Center with the Charlotte Coalition that's here. Um, and so I manage public programs and education, and we're doing some work around equity, um, which is why I'm here to learn more about education and housing and how we can use the arts to leverage that conversation. Um, but I went to New York City public schools from kindergarten up until ninth grade. And then um, my experience was really weird because I was in gifted classes. Mm -hmm. So one, I wanna ask you about the sort of insular segregation of the gifted programs in public schools. Um, and then the question that came before about the parents, I thought we were gonna get to gentrification and what that's doing to schools. So New York City in my Brooklyn is having all of that. In Charlotte, where we are, we are now having these pockets of gentr gentrification. And I wanted to know what you think that's going to end up doing um, to schools. And then as a side note, in high school, I right. got an attendance award for Brown v. Board of Education, because that was not weird at all. But they gave the black children for attending school <laughs> an okay. attendance award, and it was called the Brown v. Board of Education Attendance Award. Oh. Not strange at all. Please don't say that. <laughs> okay, your question was so long, I don't even remember what you asked me. Ah, okay, so talented and gifted is easy. I don't believe in it. Um, even though I was in it myself, I don't believe in it. I think, I don't mind um, if kids get pulled out for a short period of time a day for additional and supplemental instruction, which was the way that my talented and gifted worked. But I just don't believe that some kids are brilliant and other kids are not. And those kids we've decided are brilliant, deserve to have better and more rigorous instruction because what the research shows is all kids benefit from that type of rigorous instruction. And they rise up to the challenge of that. Now that makes it more difficult for educators, right? Because educators then have to differentiate between kids who are at different levels, but that's called good instruction. And I just don't believe, and, and I'm not saying it's easy. I know that it's not easy. But I just, I don't believe that we need to keep separating our kids in different ways. And particularly when you understand, um, so in New York City, as in many diverse school districts, talented and gifted is a way to keep white parents in the schools because their children are going to be separated. Uh, the assumption is that those kids are going to test into talented and gifted. We test for talented and gifted in New York at four, the age of four. Parents are putting their kids in test prep at the age of three. Now, I'm not sure about this, but I feel like if you're gifted, you can't prepare for it, right? Like, <laughs> you either are or you aren't. Like, my parents didn't put me in anything. And, you know, so the fact that you know that you can prep to get into this is telling you it's not actually measuring giftedness, it's measuring advantage. And so it is not surprising then who gets in those classes? And it sends, you know, to me, you want to see me get irate is to be in a school with the talented and gifted and watching those black kids who know that those are the smart kids and all those kids are white. There's a problem with that. Um, the way that giftedness works is there are a percentage of people who are exceptional across all races. So if you are in a majority black and Latino school system and the only people who are exceptional are white, you're clearly not measuring for talent, right? You're measuring for something else. So I don't, I don't believe in it. Um, I don't believe in specialized high schools, not public schools. I don't believe in tracking. I don't believe in talented and gifted. I think our kids all deserve to get the same education and to learn from each other. Uh, your question about gentrification. Gentrification can be an opportunity. It's just seldom not done well. Right, if you have these neighborhoods where uh, there's been a complete abandonment of schools by people who have middle income, neighborhoods that are cut off and um, isolated by both race and class, when you have white middle class people moving into the neighborhood, it's not necessarily a bad thing. When they come into the schools, it's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, that's actually what I'm advocating for. But what happens then is often they take over the PTA, they take over the power structures of the school. All of a sudden, the people who are in the school before feel like they have lost power within their own schools, and then those schools tend to flip. So I think if it's carefully managed, what we were pushing for in my daughter's school was called controlled choice. 
um, which meant a certain percentage of the seats were held aside for um, low-income kids. And then anyone else in the neighborhood could come in on top of that. And that's a way of ensuring that those schools don't flip. But I think it takes a lot of work. I think gentrification in general can be good. I live in Bed-Stuy. We are, I think, undergoing the terrible type of gentrification. But I do like having a coffee shop. <laughs> I mean, bodega coffee is fine, but sometimes, you know, something a little nicer. So it's, it's not a bad thing. Like, people in my neighborhood are happy to see investment in the neighborhood. It's just, unfortunately, they no longer can afford to live in the neighborhood. So I think that's, that's the problem. But if, if school systems are thinking about these things and managing how it happens, it can be, it can be a very positive thing. But none of this happens by accident. It all has to be very intentional, and seldom is it intentional. Is that it? Oh, last question. Right here in the back. Hi. Hi. So, um, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, cool. Um, I'm a sophomore at Duke. Um, I'm actually from Durham, so I went to school here. And um, I actually went to Jordan High School. I don't know uh -huh. if you're familiar with it. But, um, yeah, yay. <laughs> okay, I got stories about how people at Jordan were gaming the attendance system so they didn't have to go to Hillside, even though they're actually zoned to Hillside. They still do. But. They still do. Um, but Jordan claims to be um, a, not have a racial mi uh, majority, so it, it's about roughly even as far as um, black and white, and then we have about 12% of uh, Latino population. And so, um, but as I was in high school, I saw a very clear division between um, the types of students in the higher level classes. And so I wanted to know what your opinion was in terms of how you fight um, segregation within a school that claims to be integrated. Um, you wanna see a battle, try to detract an integrated high school. Um, but that's what you have to do. You have to get rid of tracks, which means every kid gets access to the same classes. And um, a lot of parents fight that very rigorously because they want their kids to have 12 advanced placement classes. You don't actually need 12 advanced placement classes. Um, when you think about how do all these measures come in, one of the ways that school districts got around desegregation was to create schools within schools. And the advanced classes would be exactly how they are at Jordan. The problem is, can you get enough students or parents to say that we are going to get rid of these different tracks and everyone will have access to the same courses? That's the only way that you can solve that. Some people say, well, we should just work to get more black kids in those classes or you know, give a different, work on the test that gets you in. I just think we should stop separating kids in general. I think that you know, I had one advanced placement class in high school. My high school only offered one. It didn't hurt my life. You know, I, I just think we need to get a grip about. <laughs> and I, and I, I understand that, like, there's a lot of pressure on parents. Like, if you're not trying to grab every single advantage for your kid, then people look at you like you're not being a great parent. But is the goal in life that your kid gets into Harvard, or is the goal in your life that your kid, like, be a good person and do something valuable with their life, right? <laughs> When I say, like, I don't care if my kid gets all of that, I really actually don't care if my kid gets all that. I want my kid to get a good education. I want my child to be able to think about the world. But I also want her to, like, be an empathetic person. I want her to be a person who does good. I want her to be a person who, though she has a lot of advantages, doesn't think she's better than the other kids in her class. And thinking that we have to have these tracks that give certain kids who we think are worthy this extra advantage when it's those kids who already had every other advantage, I just, I, I can't, I just can't endorse it. And the last thing I'll say is people always ask me, no one asks, no one really asks me this, and thank God, because I, I give a really bitter answer these days. Um, you know, what can, what can we do? And then I tell them what to do, and they're like, oh, no, we're not doing that. The fix on this is going to be very uncomfortable and very difficult. And anything else that is not going to cause a giving up of something is not going to fix the problem. So if you're not prepared to give up something, then just acknowledge you're a hypocrite and you're not actually going to fix the problem, and let's move on. And I think with that, he's like, you need to get off the stage. <laughs>
<laughs> but thank you all. Thank you.